Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a hot minute, but here we are once again. When I began this journey back in 2020, when I made my first video about Opus Dei, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I would still be talking about them two years later and be nowhere near what I feel like is a natural conclusion to the Deep Dive series. Every single time I think I've rounded the corner and the end is in sight, some other piece of information or some other individual co will come out of the woodwork and I am just blown away by how much information there is to cover. To be honest, sometimes it can feel really, really overwhelming, but I am constantly reminded of why I began doing this in the first place, which is to just raise awareness and give a voice to people who I feel have been maligned and misrepresented and denied having a voice and speaking out about what has happened to them. So all of that said, hello and welcome or welcome back. My name is Rebecca and this is The Deep Dive Project. Obviously, some things have changed since my last video, which was all about Opus Dei's involvement in something known as Operation Gladio. And if you haven't seen that, I really think you should go back and check it out. It's a really good history lesson about a period in world history that I think more people should be familiar with. But when I posted that video, it was over on my main channel. And since then, I've basically split my content in two because I realized there was a lot of dissonance between my lighter hearted vlog style content that I love to do and this heavier deep dive style content that I feel really passionate about. And so in order to streamline things and keep things simple, I decided to move the deep dive content about this particular topic and any future topics I decide to cover over over here to this channel and going forward this is where everything will live but that's why if you go back and watch the earlier videos it still has my intro and my handle for my main channel I know that can be a little bit confusing but in the interest of just keeping everything simple and clean I really felt like moving everything over here was the right move now all of that said since it has been so long since I dove into the twisted world of the Opus Dei cult and yes I say that without reservation or misgiving um, you can check out my video on Opus Dei and the bite model if you want to understand why I say that. I thought we would take some time to catch up on the work and see what they've been up to lately. Shortly after I began researching Opus Dei, I created a Google alert for keywords related to the organization. And it depends on the week, but generally I get about a half a dozen hits delivered to my inbox. Not all of it is worth taking a second look at. To be honest, most of them are complimentary articles written about Opus Dei by Opus Dei, and it's quite a bit of an echo chamber effect. But every once in a while, I get a gem that I might have otherwise missed. So in this video, we are going to talk about how Opus Dei has been represented in the press within the last several months to year, and what I think can be deduced from that. So buckle up and hold on because it's a pretty interesting ride. The biggest story that I have seen and the one that I want to spend the most time focusing on was published in AP back in November of 2021. The story originally broke on La Nation back in May, but I didn't see anything about it until November. I remember when I got the alert for this article, I immediately wanted to talk about it, but I just wasn't in a good position to do so until now. For those of us who are clued into what Opus Dei actually is and how they operate, this story, while heartbreaking and incredibly frustrating, is hardly news. If anything, it just further solidifies what I have already known. So the headline for this particular article reads, Women in Argentina claim labor exploitation by Opus Dei. Before we get into it, I just want to issue a quick apology because I know I'm probably going to mispronounce some names and places. Every single time I'm researching for these videos, I'm reminded of the fact that I really should take the time to learn a little bit of Italian and Spanish because it would probably help a lot, especially because the vast majority of the articles that I'm looking at are written in other countries and oftentimes in other languages. So it can get really interesting trying to get everything translated and make sure that the information I'm reading is accurate. The story is really, really heartbreaking, um, so we'll go ahead and get into it. So it says, Lucia Jimenez still suffers pain in her knees from the years she spent scrubbing floors in the men's bathroom at the Opus Dei residence in Argentina's capital for hours without pay. 
Jimenez, now 56, joined the conservative Catholic group in her native Paraguay at the age of 14 with the promise she would get an education. But instead of math or history, she was trained in cooking, cleaning, and other household chores to serve in Opus Dei residences and retirement homes. For 18 years, she washed clothes, scrubbed bathrooms, and attended to the group's needs for 12 hours a day with breaks only for meals and praying. Despite her hard labor, she says, quote, I never saw money in my hands, end quote. Jimenez and 41 other women have filed a complaint against Opus Dei to the Vatican for alleged labor exploitation as well as abuse of power and of conscience. The Argentine and Paraguayan citizens worked for the movement in Argentina, Paraguay, Bolivia, Uruguay, Italy, and Kazakhstan between 1974 and 2015. Opus Dei, Work of God in Latin, was founded by the Spanish priest Jose Maria Escriva in 1928 and has 90,000 members in 70 countries. The lay group, which was greatly favored by John Paul II, who canonized Escriva in 2002, has a unique status in the church and reports directly to the Pope. Most members are laymen and women with secular jobs and families who strive to sanctify ordinary life. Other members are priests or celibate lay people. The complaint alleges the women, often minors at the time, labored under manifestly illegal conditions that included working without pay for 12 hours plus without breaks except for food or prayer, no registration in the social security system, and other violations of basic rights. The women are demanding financial reparations from Opus Dei and that it acknowledges the abuses and apologizes to them, as well as the punishment of those responsible. Quote, I was sick of the pain on my knees, of getting down on my knees to do the showers, end quote, Jimenez told the Associated Press. They don't give you time to think, to criticize, and say that you don't like it. You have to endure because you have to surrender totally to God. In a statement to the AP, Opus Dei said that it had not been notified of the complaint to the Vatican, but has been in contact with the women's legal representatives to, quote, listen to the problems and find a solution, end quote. The women in the complaint have one thing in common, humble origins. They were recruited and separated from their families between the ages of 12 and 16. In some cases, like Jimenez's, they were taken to Opus Dei centers in another country, circumventing immigration controls. They claim that Opus Dei priests and other members exercised coercion of conscience on the women to pressure them to serve and to frighten them with spiritual evils if they didn't comply with the supposed will of God. They also controlled their relations with the outside world. Most of the women asked to leave as the physical and psychological demands became intolerable, but when they finally did, they were left without any money. Many also said they needed psychological treatment after leaving Opus Dei. The hierarchy of Opus Dei is aware of these practices, said Sebastian Saul, the women's lawyer. It is an internal policy of Opus Dei. The search for these women is conducted the same way throughout the world. It is something institutional. The women's complaint filed in September with the Vatican Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith also points to dozens of priests affiliated with Opus Dei for their alleged intervention, participation, and knowledge in the denounced events. The allegations in the complaint are similar to those made by members of another conservative Catholic organization also favored by John Paul II, the Legion of Christ. The Legion recruited young women to become consecrated members of its lay branch, Regnum Christi, to work in Legion-run schools and other projects. Those women alleged spiritual and psychological abuse of being separated from family and being told their discomfort was God's will, and that abandoning their vocation would be tantamount to abandoning God. Pope Francis has been cracking down on 20th century religious movements after several religious orders and lay groups were accused of sexual and other abuses by their leaders. Opus Dei has so far avoided much of the recent controversy, though there have been cases of individual priests accused of misconduct. We do not have any official notification from the Vatican about the existence of a complaint of this type, Josefina Madriaga, director of Opus Dei's press office in Argentina, told the AP. She said the women's lawyer informed the group last year of their complaints about the lack of contributions to Argentina's social security system. If there is a traumatic experience or one that has left them with a wound, we want to honestly listen to them, understand what happened, and from there, recorrect what has to be corrected, she said. She added that all the people currently working on site are paid, adding that some 80 women currently work for Opus Dei in Argentina.
However, she said, quote, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, society as a whole dealt with these issues in a more informal or family way. Opus Dei has made the necessary changes and modifications to accompany the law in force today, end quote. Beatriz Delgado, who worked for Opus Dei for 23 years in Argentina and Uruguay, said she was told that, quote, I had to give my salary to the director and that everyone gave it. It was part of giving to God, end quote. They convince you with the vocation with God calls you, God asks this of you, you cannot feel God. They hooked me with that, she said. So far, the Vatican has not ruled on the complaint. And, if it, and it's not clear if it will. A Vatican spokesperson did not immediately respond to a request for information. If there is no response, the women's legal representatives say they will initiate criminal proceedings for human trafficking, reduction to servitude, awareness control, and illegitimate deprivation of liberty against Opus Dei in Argentina and other countries the women worked in. Argentine law sanctions human trafficking with prison sentences of 4 to 15 years. The statute of limitations is 12 years after the alleged crime ceases. They say, we're going to help poor people, but it's a lie. They don't help, they keep the money for themselves, Jimenez said. It is very important to achieve some justice. So. There is a lot to unpack in this one article, but there are a few things that stood out to me. First and foremost, there is the idea that anything negative that may have allegedly occurred happened in some far distant past. Remember that Madriaga admitted labor abuse happened, but only in the far gone 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, even though the article states early on that the 41 women filing the complaint worked for Opus Dei up until 2015, which wasn't that long ago at all. This is something I've noticed organizations will do in an attempt to downplay the severity of whatever they are dealing with, and it's not exclusive to religious organizations. Either they will try to imply that anything bad that has happened was in the far distant past and everything is better now, or they will suggest that even if current events aren't pretty, they have a history of being a force for good, so how bad can they really be? The second thing I noticed was how this story perfectly illustrates the psychological, spiritual, and emotional manipulation groups like Opus Dei employ to keep its members in line. This is something that we have talked about many, many times. It's a very common theme and it continues to be true throughout every single story that I read. Secrecy, denial, and gaslighting are staples of a cult with a vested interest in keeping rigid control over its members. And any resistance is quickly dispelled with using the will of God as a catch-all. Of course, every organization, group, or even nation, if it withstands the test of time, is bound to collect some unfortunate stories over time. But if history has taught us anything, it should be that running from and denying the past is a quick road to nowhere. Yet Opus Dei seems committed to a deny, 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 dog whistle and redirect methodology that has frustratingly continued to work well for them. I think that it just goes to show how successful their damage control measures are. Since the AP article was published in November, there has been nothing but crickets. The situation got some brief notice in an article published in La Capitale titled The Pope Made Reforms That Do Not Satisfy and Blur Opus Dei, stating that, quote, the women who sued continue to wait not only for Opus Dei to ask for their forgiveness, but also for financial reparation at the time of their old age and after having worked for years without salaries or contributions, end quote. Who knows if the women will ever see a dime for their years in Opus Dei's servitude? I probably won't hold my breath. Interestingly, that same article goes on to discuss changes the Pope made to the chain of command in the Apostolic Constitution. It is relevant to this video because in what has been perceived as a slight, the Pope withheld appointing the current Opus Dei prelate a bishop and decided that the work will no longer report to the congregation of bishops but to the dicastery for the clergy. I had to look up what that exactly means, and according to the CNA, the dicastery for the clergy is a body of priests and deacons that oversee the operations and execution of their pastoral ministry within the diocese. This decision and change has ruffled quite a few feathers, not the least of which is the miffed not-bishop prelate who was quoted saying, 
This means that Opus Dei becomes a common congregation without a bishop. It implies that jurisdiction over its people is removed. It is as if a military bishop no longer commands the military. So what Opus Dei does now will depend on the bishop of the place where it is. This does not automatically mean an intervention of the bishops, but they can, by the new canon law, order some work for them and the opus must obey." End quote. In essence, this decision removes quite a bit of authority over the work from the prelate and transfers it to the bishop of the archdiocese and opus dei center may find itself in. It's kind of hard to see this as anything other than a subtle kick in the pants, but the question of what exactly precipitated it remains. Some blame it on the fact that the current pope is a Jesuit and there is a long history of seemingly mutually shared dislike of the other. Escriva himself pretty famously hated the Jesuits. But perhaps it has less to do with old grudges and more to do with the fact that it is quickly becoming clear that Opus Dei is out of control. Up until now, the organization has enjoyed a uniquely independent status as a personal prelature, but in light of the most recent allegations being levied against the cult by the Argentinian women, I have to wonder if this decision is a punishment and a thinly veiled pontifical threat. Get yourselves under control now or else. These changes come on the heels of headlines such as Spain's church seeks to add credence to inquiry of alleged child abuse one month and then Spanish bishops say they won't participate in national clerical abuse inquiry the following month, which is more than enough to give anyone a bit of whiplash. And I don't think any of us would really be that surprised to find Opus Dei in the midst of it all. In February of this year, Reuters reported that Spain's Catholic church was seeking to give more credence to an investigation into the alleged sexual abuse of minors, indicating at the time that they were eager to allow any victims to have representation and a day in court. According to the article, Spanish prosecutors were investigating 68 cases, but El Pais newspaper reportedly found 1,200 cases reported between 1943 and 2018. In any case, at that time, the bishops' conference seemed intent on pursuing justice, at least for those 68 releasing a statement that, quote, we are deeply saddened by the abuses that have happened at the institution. The Bishop's Conference wants to take a step in its duty of bringing transparency, help, and reparation to the victims in collaboration with the authorities, end quote. However, between that point and the end of April, something changed. After the national legislature decided to open up a nationwide investigation into sexual abuse and misconduct allegations, the Bishop's Conference suddenly got cold feet. They alleged that the investigation would disproportionately focus on sexual abuse committed by members of the Catholic Church to the exclusion of all else. Suddenly, when someone other than the authority of the Church took an interest, the Bishop's Conference was a lot less keen to participate, choosing instead to call for, quote, collaboration and prudence so as not to exaggerate and not re-victimize the victims, end quote. This is all more than enough to leave a sour taste in the back of your throat, but it gets better. The law firm hired to conduct an audit the investigation is headed by Javier Cremades, and although he has stated that he is here as a lawyer, not a faithful, a number of victims' associations are wary, seeing the move as nothing but another smokescreen which will only continue to hide the truth and deny victims their rights. I think all of this can be summed up by a statement released by a spokesman for one of the victims' associations, Stolen Childhood. Quote, they want their faithful to protect them. Had the church had real intentions of doing a thorough investigation, it would have been done by now. End quote. Now, I want to go on record and state that I'm not necessarily accusing Opus Dei, or the Catholic Church for that matter, of having a vested interest in keeping the sins of the past tightly under wraps. But while the situation in Argentina and Spain play out across the globe, the Filipino Church is having its own open mouth insert foot moment with an Opus Dei undercurrent. In March, the bishops issued a letter condemning an election candidate's efforts to whitewash abuses committed during an era of late dictator Ferdinand Marcos 
Davis Sr. They did so on the anniversary of the People Power Revolution, also known as the EDSA Revolution, which commemorates a series of demonstrations in the 80s which were organized to protest regime violence and electoral fraud. It warned Filipino Catholics not to be swayed by propaganda, claiming that the martial law years were golden years in Philippine history, which is relevant since the propaganda is coming from the camp of presidential frontrunner Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr., the dictator's son. An Opus Dei priest and newspaper columnist, Father Roy Amora Simagala, criticized the bishop's letter, choosing to call it divisive and rebuking the bishops for daring to have an opinion on the political future of the country. This is all very ironic, considering the proactive role Opus Dei likes to play in politics. If you don't know what I mean, go back and watch my video about the work's involvement in American politics, as well as the role it played in the Chilean coup to overthrow Salvador Allende and many other nefarious activities in South America. But following in its founder's footsteps, Opus Dei has always been believers in the do as I say, not as I do methodology. So wrapping all of this up in a tidy bow is going to be difficult, but the articles and stories presented in this video do prove one thing. That regardless of what Opus Dei says, the organization continues to be as polarizing and divisive as ever, and as more and more people speak out about the wrongs committed against them while they were in contact with the work, that probably won't change anytime soon. I wish I could say that I felt confident that those who are seeking justice will have their day in court, that Opus Dei or the Vatican or both will acknowledge what has happened and work towards making amends, and that something resembling transparency and honesty will be the overarching themes going forward, but I am just not that optimistic. Certainly there are some interesting developments, but only time will tell if anything tangible comes of it all. Anytime I look into what Opus Dei has been up to, I find I learn the most by paying attention to what has not been said, rather than what the organization's PR team releases to the press. So if you read between the lines like I do, you are probably drawing a lot of the same conclusions. Either way, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and would like to see more news update type content like this, give this video a thumbs up and that'll let me know. This is definitely something that we could do every three to six months or so because I find that there is quite a bit of press that put, gets put out, but people probably just don't see it unless you have a Google alert like I do. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to this channel. My goal is to devote more time to content on this channel specifically, so if you are in favor of that, subscribing is an awesome way to support me and my efforts. And before I let you go, I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you who has continued to reach out to me and share your stories and your perspective and express your gratitude. I would hope it would be awesome obvious that I am not doing this for any kind of clout or notoriety. It's simply a need that I feel needs to be filled by somebody and I am more than happy to try to step up to the plate. So anytime somebody comes out and tells me about their experience or expresses gratitude, it means more than you probably realize and I really, really appreciate it. I also want to mention that this channel now has an Instagram page so you can go find me at The Deep Dive Project. I share links and he news headlines and bits and bobs related to the content that I'm sharing here and it's a great way to connect with me outside of this YouTube channel. So if you want to go and follow me there, you definitely can. Anyway, that is it for now. Thank you so much for watching and I hope I will see you for the next video.